Just some uh, housekeeping. They wanted me to remind everybody that the uh, after party starts at six. There's food, drinks, that kind of thing. So um, we're in track two. Uh, Wolfgang Gorlick, uh, naked boulder rolling, applying risk management to web application security. Um, thank you for his time and enjoy the talk. All right. Thanks so much. Yeah, so my name is Wolfgang Gulick. I'm the Information Systems Manager and Information Security Manager for a financial services firm out in Michigan. An undisclosed financial services firm, and I love that term, undisclosed, right? I kind of have the image like I'm flying around, I'm fighting all the bad guys, I'm a superhero. I go to Cleveland, in the phone booth, I'm undisclosed. <laughs> no one knows who I am. Especially in this environment, you know, in something like B-Sides Cleveland, I'm sure I'm really incognito, and I appreciate that, because uh, we could possibly Google me, right? Uh, but I do, like everyone else who's got an employer, I have to point out that what I'm about to speak to is my own thoughts, not that of my employer. And in no way, in no way, shape, or form, should naked boulder rolling be used as investment advice. I tweet at Jada Gorlick if you want to shoot any, any questions or troll me. I also blog some of these ideas at jadafgorlick.us. And I do a bunch of stuff in Michigan. I come from a consulting background, and of course consulting background is the ultimate superhero, right? They literally pay you to come in and fight the bad guys and leave. And some things I learned from being a consultant in the security field is security is the technology, right? You got a problem? Don't worry, I can sell you something. Data, <laughs> it's true. If you don't want uh, data loss, I mean right over there, data loss prevention, we got a box that we can sell you. And uh, security is also the best practices, right? Do the right thing in the right way at the right time, the boogeyman won't get you and your career will be long and your life will be happy. And security is project based, either because you bought something from my firm, which is fantastic, I can implement it with best practices, or because you bought something from someone else's firm, you're bringing me in to secure it. And this was a great, this served me very, very well from college up until I landed this job at this undisclosed financial services firm. And then I got a little stressed. And I think, and I talk to security people all the time, I'm very fortunate. Um, to know a lot of people in Michigan who are in the security field. And they all say it, right? They're all overwhelmed, they're all overworked. And I think it's just the nature of the game. I think it's the nature of the beast. And it's a lot of, it has to do with how we think about security, right? So for example, give me a couple of sentences. Who here agrees with this? You know, it's not if a breach will occur, it's when a breach will occur. Come on, who doesn't agree with that? Everyone does, absolutely. But compare that and contrast that with this other jug of, uh, of wisdom that you hear all the time. We're all but one breach away from unemployment. You know what I mean? I love that. You don't often see those right next to each other. When you do, it really drops the point home. It's not if, but when we got the RGE. It's not if, but when we got the resume generating event. <laughs> yes, but don't be stressed. Don't be stressed. Everything's fine. Everything's going to be okay. So I started at the security firm, got a little stressed about 2008. Spent the past four years trying to figure out what worked well for managing security. I'm going to share that with you today in what would have been 50 minutes, but Technology is what it is, so it'll probably be about 45 minutes. Rapid pace. And of course, the very first thing that I did in a stress environment, the very first thing I did to avoid the resume generating event, <laughs> secure all the systems, right? There's every single blinking box has got to be secure. That's my job. I don't want to be fired. I got to secure all the systems. Of course, then it only got worse, as anyone who's tried to secure all the systems knows. I mean, we we're just talking about it out in the hallway. I mean, everyone talks about how much there is to know on information security. Think about security as best practice. I mean, it really comes from knowing your systems very well. It comes from having intimate knowledge of your systems. Take them out for some wine, sharing your dreams. No. Um, <laughs> but, you know, testing, learning, pen testing, right? Setting it up in the, in the lab, beating on it, kicking over your sandcastle, figuring out what went wrong, building your sandcastle again, building it better. Which would have worked great, I think, if we were all security professionals in the 1970s. Give me a mainframe and that would be fantastic. Doesn't work well today, doesn't scale well. When I talk to security professionals in their full time, I usually see something very similar to these numbers. Um, maybe 20 IT professionals they're working with, about one security professional to 1,000 employees. But the key thing is about one security professional to 5,000 devices. I think that's pretty typical. Switches, servers, routers, apps, think about it. 5,000 devices, it's easy, easily you hit that. So you want to secure all the systems. You want to be full on, full in, do everything right, right way at the right time so the bad guys don't get you. Do that math. 12 hours a day, 365 days a year. Who needs a vacation? Uh, and it, it works out to about one hour per device per year. It's ridiculous. You can't do it. If you feel overwhelmed and you're in information security, there's a reason for that. It's because we are overwhelmed. 
the way it is. And even if you could spend an hour right now after this talk, if you could go spend an hour with your key system, there's absolutely no way it's going to be secure next week, next month, next quarter, next year, right? Because things change too fast. According to McAfee, in 2011, about 1,000 pieces of new malware every single day. 100 new vulnerabilities every single day. And the number of blogs, papers, tweets, oh, I don't even start with tweets. The number of information coming out is, what, hundreds easily of new things, new ways that people can get you. And I did an experiment back in 2008, like I said, when I started to feel stressed. I took a vacation. As a security guy, I think, you know, you see, I took a vacation, sort of like saying, I went to Reno and I shot a man just to watch him die. <laughs> but yeah, I took a vacation. And I let all the news pile up, right? RSS feeds, emails, news groups, everything. And I let it pile up and I ran a couple things as a statistical analysis to see how long it would take me to read. And I went, oh, that doesn't really look like that. And then I actually spent the better part of the next two to three months reading everything. And not just reading it to say, okay, what's its surface? But okay, there's this new attack. It's on full disclosure. Let's build it in the lab. Let's try it out. And it occurred to me, and my, this is my statistic, yours may vary, that about one day's worth of new news that hits the internet is about four days worth of reading. So if you think it's insurmountable with information security, it's because it is. If you think it's changing too fast, it's because it is. There's just plain and simple too much to do. And that's how I got to start thinking about security as a Greek tragedy, right? We all know the Greek tragedy, three acts, Taurus, Siso, I mean the god. And uh, all of us in this room, we're the hero, right? We're doing the best thing in the best way. But we know it's not if but when the curtain will fall. We know it's not if but when the bad guys will get us. We know it's not if but when we'll end up with our eyes gouged out. And then we wonder why we're stressed. So another thing I was thinking about was sort of Sisyphus, right? You guys know the thing about Sisyphus? You know, you had the rock, or the rock up the hill. God's punishment, put it back down, or the rock up the hill, again and again. And that might be okay, again, if you had one system, one mainframe, one whatever. But in today's information security, we have hundreds of systems, right? Each one of boulders with a weight on our shoulders. We have hundreds of systems that each one we come in the day and we play this game of corporate capture the hill and look at our systems at the bottom and go, I don't want anyone to get those. And we roll as many of the top of the hill as possible in a secure state and go to bed feeling good. And then we come in, thousands of new pieces of malware, hundreds of new vulnerabilities. Our systems that we just spent the past day rolling to the top of the hill, down the valley. And we do that again and again and again. And for many people, that's what information security management is. That's why it's much better to be a consultant. <laughs> and so I started thinking about this as information security as a Greek strategy. I explained this the first time at GERCOM. Coincidentally enough, I also had a laptop that I couldn't get working, so I think this is kind of cool. I got sort of the B side of the GERCOM thing going on. Uh, and, and some people trolled me. That's okay. I, I'm all aware of it. And I'm not the kind of guy to feed trolls. I'm the kind of guy to make a big deal about it. I'm not the kind of guy to name any names <laughs> or to point out Google's your friend. And I'm definitely not the kind of guy to kind of say, hey, you know, we are in the home of the social engineering toolkit. Not going to make a de big deal about it. But one of the funny things that they said that really stuck in my mind is, in the business track, Wolfgang's telling us all about naked boulder rolling. I'm like, come on, guys, it's not naked boulder rolling. It's a Greek tragedy. Highbrow, not naked boulder rolling. So I always thought about it. I'm like, okay, call it the Stockholm Syndrome. I can deal with that. I can deal with naked boulder rolling. I mean, defense is the new sexy. That's what they say. At least that's what I keep telling myself. And I tell my wife. And yeah. <laughs> but anyways, and hack naked is, is, of course, a very popular meme from the Paul.com guys. So fine. If you think about information security as technology, if you think about information security as practices, what you're really talking about, if you try and implement that in a security program, is information security as boulder rolling. Day after day after day getting ground down, trying to keep as many of the boulders at the top of the hill as possible in this great corporate game of capture the hill that we play. But that's just technology. That's just practices. There are also projects I mentioned. And so I was kind of thinking about this after Gurkhan, what's a good way of explaining technology as projects? Because technology as projects, similar to practices, it really comes from doing a good job, right? You come in, you do the best job you can, research, do a point in time solution, put it in. Best case scenario, best case scenario is they say, hey, guys, we got this new system. Take as much time as you want to secure it. Spend some time, research, understand it. And you write a great report. You hand it to the developers and they're like, thank you. I always wondered why I couldn't use string copy. And you hand it to the administrators and they're like, oh, you're right. I'll turn off it, the firewall and stop making everyone a minister. And even in that best case scenario, very best case scenario in technology practices, you have what's a talk to you, right? Time to check, time to use. 
Yeah, it's secure when you check it. Yeah, it's secure when the project goes live. But is it still secure after administrators have been troubleshooting and doing whatever they're doing? Is it still secure after the developers have been adding new features? No, of course not. And just like technology in general, it's constantly rolling down the hill. So I got a great example or analogy from Jeff Rich. Jeff Rich was on the Follow the White Rabbit podcast. And this is what Jeff Rich said. He's the uh, chief risk officer at uh, Layered. Jeff Rich said, if you imagine a company and they're trying to launch a new system, and that company's got stakeholders, that company's got resources, they put their back into it. They really want to make the system the best it can. They've got uh, you know, responsibilities. They've got to do what they've got to do. And at some point in time, that system's ready to launch. And that's when you get that call. Yeah, hi, Wolf. Yeah, I know it's about uh, 1 o'clock and it's Friday and you're out of the office. But uh, the system's going live on Monday. And we told the customers, CEO's already promised to the board, just do your magic security stuff. It's all gone, it's all good, just sprinkle on your magic security dust. So what Jeff Rich said is, if you think about technology as projects, what you're basically saying is, at the time the boulder is rolling off the cliff, that's when you get the call. Hey, control where this lands for us because we really want it to be secure. Just do your magic security thing. Put differently, not only are we rolling boulders, but the business is flipping, throwing boulders at us. And again, we wonder why we're stressed, right? So you could think of information security as naked boulder catching if you were so inclined. So I started in 2008 trying to figure out how could I do a better job managing security? How could I have time with my kids, time to have some fun, time to make it out to conferences like Lee Sides Cleveland? And I really went through a process of three main shifts. Realigning with the business, implementing a risk management program, using that time that I saved and now had available to implement a lifecycle management. And at the end of it today, I'm pretty proud of my team. I'm pretty proud of my firm because I think we have a very robust, mature security program. And so for about the next 20 minutes, I'm going to rapid pace go through all this. Um, again, it's a lot, but it's just, you know, four years, 45 minutes, there you go. At the end of that, I'm right in the middle of an of a active project, so I'll show you my project du jour and illustrate how some of these ideas actually come to life when you're trying to do something. So security business alignment, it all comes down to as a solution domain, social engineering. I don't necessarily mean social engineering deceptively. Send your CEO a PDF so he clicks on it, and now you're in his box and you can authorize all the PEOs. Uh, no, I actually, you know, I mean literally the art of engineering social situations. We are upholding the best of your ethics, the best of our profession, in such a way that we're doing the best for the organization. And I think if we are considering our jobs as security professionals to roll boulders, we really focus in on the technology. And just like some of the presentations we heard uh, today, I was listening to a presentation with um, Ghost Nomad earlier, we kind of forget about the people component, right? So we really have to focus in on that people component. Think about social engineering 101, you got the guy with, you know, the freshman, he's got the shirt, I don't know if you can see it. There's no patch for human stupidity. And what's he going to do? He's going to identify his target, right? He's going to mimic the organization. He's going to integrate in with the person's mental frame and exploit it and grab the information and go, which is fantastic. Good for you, guy. You got that password. The help desk is going to give you anyways. Uh, but from a security engineer perspective, a security manager, you can't leave, right? So if you think about it as a 200 level, I'd say many of the same ideas apply. Establishing a clear goal, speaking the language the business understands, finding alignment, what do they care about and how does that dovetail with what we care about, and moving the security program forward. An area that's been talking about this quite a bit is the SecBiz community. SecBiz is a hashtag on Twitter. SecBiz is a LinkedIn group. Um, SecBiz has a podcast now. And SecBiz really came out from Dave Kennedy this morning's keynote arguing with Rafael Los about what was most important. Is it the guy who's doing the technical controls, who has that intimate knowledge of the technology, who's making sure the bits and bytes are correct and that all the technical controls are done, secure all the systems? Or is it the guy who has that intimate knowledge of the business, who's making sure that the business plans are being executed and developed in a secure fashion, that security is being a consideration, that we have that top-down sponsorship and endorsement of a strong security program? And of course, the truth is are both are vitally important. So SecBiz is a great place that's been talking about this. Some of the things that SecBiz talks about and one of them I like is sort of the concept of talk about the trucks, right? So if you're in a shipping company, you don't go to the shipping company and say, hey, we need a DLP box, we need an IDS box, I'm going to stop all the mail, we've got 1,000 pieces of new coming every day, and I block them all. And they're going to go, yeah, oh, okay, just go make sure the exchange is up. 
No, you talk about things that matter to them, which is getting the trucks on time. So in my organization, we talk about things like assets under management, retaining clients, et cetera. That'll come back when we get to the project I'm working on. And uh, aligning at the top, signing at the bottom, I'll get back to that. So with aligning with the business, starting to talk more about what matters to them and making sure that our goals, what we're working on really aligns with what their goals are. Okay, you want to retain clients? No problem, I need the security program to do X, Y, and Z. They start to listen to us, right? Oh, okay, you hear what I'm saying, that's good, and you're trying to help me achieve what I'm saying, fantastic, what do you need? And the first thing I'd say that we need is in a robust security program is risk management. Risk management, this comes from NIST, 830, social publication on risk management, protect the organization and stability performance mission. I think, at least me personally, I was having trouble seeing the forest for the trees, the hill for the boulders. You know, when you're, all you're doing is rolling boulders and it's, it's really hard to know how any one of them really is impacting or empowering the organization. And without knowing that, we can't really make good decisions. So the obvious problem is prioritize, no problem. Secure all the systems, do what's important. Just make a priority list, right? It's easy. It's not easy. Because the question is, if you've got thousands of systems and, or thousands of employees running on hundreds of systems, 5,000 devices all over the place, with 20 IT people pulling levers, making people administrate, doing everything they've got to do to close the tickets, keep people happy, you got to ask the ultimate question. You guys know what the ultimate question is, right? The secure people? What the hell does all this stuff do? What does this box mean to the network? What does that router mean to the fact we've got a growth strategy? What does all this stuff really do? And uh, that's a hard question to answer. One of the solution demands I found very helpful in answering that was business continuity. And uh, in my organization, we were always getting the question, right? If the asteroid falls from the sky, the levels of the data center, and it's a smoking crater, how can we stay in business? How can we stay in the market? How are we still trading? How are we satisfying the customers, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm like, great, that's what you're concerned about. You're absolutely right, those asteroids are coming. I'm like, it's probably more likely we're gonna get hacked. But uh, asteroids, let's, let's talk about asteroids. Business continuity, I love business continuity. As a solution to me, it's very helpful to determine what the hell all this stuff does. It's not something people often talk about at security conferences, this is one of the domains of IC squared, so CPE on our forehead, woo -hoo. Um, But one of the things I like about business continuity is the way it abstracts information. Technology is technology, right? A server is a server is a server. HP, Dell, it doesn't matter. A server is a server. An app is an app. Java, Ruby, uh, Python is my Python friend here now. But um, an app is an app, a server is a server. What it really matters is let's keep it very simple and start tying it back up to the business processes. Because if we can tie it back up to the business processes, we can then answer some very serious questions. If that business process can't be accomplished, same day, short term, long term, what does it mean to the organization's mission? If the business can't do X because the technology has been impacted by availability attack, what does it mean? And we can begin to do an impact analysis and start figuring out, okay, what is the operational impact of the organization? What kind of money do we have at risk? What are we protecting against? And the flip side of that, we can start looking at the upside, right? What are we as the IT department or security department enabling? You're making this much money and we're spending this much to keep that running. And then we can do a quick costing model looking at analyzed loss expectancy and whatnot. And uh, figure out the analyzed rate of currents. And I love this slide. I get to the slide, I talk about risk management from time to time and every time I get to the slide I look around the room and I'm seeing it right now because suddenly you guys are all thinking, he told me boulders and I'm hearing Bueller, <laughs> Bueller. I'm not going to talk too much about economics, but the point is there are economic ways that we can communicate to the business what we're doing. And they allow us to answer a very, very simple thing that everyone who's managing security must be able to answer. And that is, how much are we spending to protect this asset? And are we spending the right amount? We should never spend more than the asset delivers via business process to the organization's mission. That is our goal. That's how much effort we should put into rolling that boulder up for availability. And then we can do a whole bunch of stuff that I'm going to skip by. But of course, <laughs> risk management or business continuity is all about acts of God, right? The asteroid didn't aim for us. Luckily, I've never been hit by an asteroid. But you get what I'm saying. The fire didn't burn to us. Um, the flood wasn't really mad about what happened to Julian Saj and just targeted my servers. More likely what happens is that we're all worried about in, in uh, a conference like Besides Cleveland is, of course, the, the attacker. And there's plenty of evidence that the attackers are out there. I mean, what a year it's been. Zappos, 24 million credit cards, fantastic. 
In February, University of North Carolina, 350,000 students. Great, great. Global payment systems in March, 1.5 million credit cards. South Carolina was jealous, I think, because in April, 228,000. Um, University of Nebraska students are just getting hammered, not only student debt, but also people are stealing their social security numbers. Um, and LinkedIn, oh my, come on, E2 Brute. Can't you salt your passwords? 6.5 million <laughs> accounts. Ah, which begs the question, right? We already said it's not this, but when? But when that does occur, how do we make sure, oh, well, maybe I should ask the question. Anyone want to be July's poster child? No, of course not. How do we make sure that when it does occur, we're not in July because, you know, the key jewels to our organization have been stolen? Put more importantly to a lot of people in this room, how can we make sure when it does occur, we're not the ones thrown under the bus, right? So how can we make sure that our organizations are in a very safe position, our careers are in a very safe position? And risk management, I found, was very helpful in doing that. Another one of the 10 domains of security according to IC squared. I mean, this is the value of a B-Sides conference. Come on, guys. Uh, you prioritize your assets. We already talked about that. You look at your threats. You know, you disgruntled employees, external attackers, et cetera. Hacktivists. I had a hacktivist. Whenever anything goes wrong, you guys notice that they always, like, kick Sony and go after financial companies? <laughs> if any hacktivists are in the audience or listening online, landscaping, <laughs> ice cream, no. Now, my friends who are landscaping are going to send me an email. But, you know, anyone other than financials would be nice just once in a while. But, yeah, bad guys, what bad guys can do to us, um, what vulnerabilities apply. And I understand. We all want to know our systems. and We want to secure our systems. I get that. Um, and, but I'm a big fan of vulnerability assessment. I agree with Dave Kennedy that that gets maybe 50% of your vulnerabilities. does not get logical vulnerabilities. I understand all that completely. But if I can run a vulnerability assessment in an afternoon or a weekend, over my 5,000 devices and know which boulders are where in the hill and then start looking at which boulders are most important, that's going to give me some very vital intelligence about what I need to do over the next couple of weeks. So vulnerability assessment. And then we can look at things like, okay, what is the real dollar value for these risks? Um, NIST looks at things like um, what's the most revenue, highest profit. Again, I like that from operations perspective. What are we enabling? ISO looks at things like loss of credibility, reputation, the reputation assets everyone is very concerned about, rightfully so. FAIR looks at fines and judgments, et cetera. So you look at one of these three or blend thereof, and you begin to say, okay, if we get a loss of more than availability, because that's business continuity, but if we get a loss of confidentiality and integrity, if we get whacked, what does that mean to that business process to have that loss? And what does that mean to our business? Again, protecting the organization's ability to achieve its mission. And from that, we can determine what the cost of security should be to protect these assets. How much time we should spend. And we can focus on the boulders that really matter to our organizations and remediate. And uh, in terms of remediate, if I'm kind of lucky because I'm the operations manager and the security manager, so I can remediate, break things, have a closed door meeting, yell at myself a while, freaks out my staff, but uh, open the door, shake hands, say, okay, we're all getting back to work. But uh, the reality is, of course, when we remediate, that's when we break things. I think security teams in general have that very bad reputation. Oh, you guys always tell us no, and every time you run a vulnerability assessment next week, things are broken. Uh, so we really got to make sure we have good, good relationships with the business units, the IT operations folks, et cetera, because when we remediate and we push that boulder from the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill, that's when things break. Interestingly, as we'll talk about pretty shortly with LifeSec Management, if you get the boulder pretty close to the top of the hill and just roll it up a little bit, or maybe it's halfway up and you roll it up a little bit, no one notices, which is fantastic. If it's down at the bottom and everyone's admin and suddenly they're not, that's when people notice and the help desk calls. And I've got to close my door and yell at myself. Uh, and then, of course, we can dig into risk management, build, test, improve, establishing control. So we're actually improving the security program. I think of these two as like kind of like peanut butter and jelly. You know, they really go together very well. This is continuity, availability. Risk management adds confidentiality, integrity. In my organization, oh, key thing, um, risk management does not mean the same thing to financial people. A lot of people are going, huh, yeah, I get that. Yeah, I, I'm sure you've had that conversation. I did not get that. I walked into my CFO, guess what? We're doing it wrong. Oh, yeah, I need to do a risk management program. You realize we've got PhDs for that, right? And they're, not, and they're making more than you. Can you just get the exchange server to work? I mean, I keep talking about the exchange server. So in my organization, they're very concerned about business continuity. It was fantastic. I love business continuity. Let's do it. Risk management. Hey, we're already checking for availability. Let's also talk about integrity and confidentiality. So I found it was much more 
um, a much more beneficial relationship with my senior management to talk about business continuity. And now that they're calling it GRC, which is even better, because the closer we can steer from financial risk management, I think as security professionals, the better we are. Unless you have a degree in accounting, that's fantastic. Go for it. When we've done that risk management, we can begin to do something fantastic, which is do less. I love doing less. It's the old Pareto rule, right? 20% of your value comes from, well, I got that backwards. 80% of your value comes from 20% of your stuff. So if you know which 20% of your stuff is really important, you can focus on that. And if you've got the same number of boulders, same distribution, boulders in the creek, waiting for the hacktivists who are mad about doing the such, boulders up top of the hill that are nice and secure, and we've got the same amount, if you've got the right boulders in the right place, when the, not if, but when occurs, the organization's mission can continue, our careers can continue, we can clean up, move on. So put differently, risk management means rolling fewer boulders farther, focusing on the boulders that really matter to the organization's mission, and putting our time and effort and our muscle into that. So if security business alignment gets you a voice, gets you a seat at the table, gets some respect and your input is listened to, you can build risk management. If you build risk management, you can have some more time. And then you can take vacations, you can come to conferences like B-Sides Cleveland, and you can do life cycle management. Stepping away from IT for just a second, okay? I said earlier, a typical security person has a thousand employees. Let's imagine we got a thousand customers. I said earlier, a typical security professional has 20 IT people, right? Developers, engineers, whatnot. Let's imagine we have 20 bakers. Can you imagine a scenario where you're in a bakery and they go, yeah, well, uh, customer placed the order, we told them it would be there in five minutes, and we got another minute, the bakers have baked it, it's all good, it's coming to you, uh, at the flour, okay? No, come on, it's ridiculous. I don't understand why today we still have this scenario where the concept is we'll make the project and then the security people add their magic ingredients to it. You know, it's, it's really a, a bad place to be in. I'm a big fan of baking security into the project at every layer in every way and SDLC allows us to do this. In my organization, what we look at is um, preparation, implementation, security. So 20% of any project is automatically allocated to letting our people do a good job, be that with training, be that with resources, whatever they need. And I think if you look at some of these attacks we looked at earlier, um, especially LinkedIn, come on guys, it's not usually people, scary attacks that you, know, you hear about at something like besides Cleveland, where they're doing this sort of elite injection of, no, it's people just didn't know what they're doing and they went, oh, we got to get this up. There, it's in the cloud, go. Um, so by training, by spending time and making sure our people really know how to do a good job, they will do a good job and we'll be in a better place. Implementing, of course, and then making sure we've got an explicit budget, explicit sponsorship for the security component. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier about assigning responsibility at the bottom and aligning deliverables at the top. Best undeniably highlight of my career with my team um, in terms of a statement they gave me was I was preparing for a DevOps interview. I was saying, okay, well, we do DevOps now. We didn't do before. What's different? And one guy said to me, you know what the, what the big difference is? So the big difference is before, not the work, same work. Before, not the customers, same customers, and we didn't suck our employees. So the big difference is now I've got everything I need to do a good job. Now I've got the empowerment, I've got the training, I've got the tools, and I've got the time to do a good job. And to him, a good job includes security controls, even though he might not necessarily think about it that way. But to give your people the time and resources to do a good job, of course, and to get your management team to align with that vision. Wait a minute, why, why are we training our people? Don't they know how to do this? Didn't we hire them for that? No, you're training your people because we're ensuring they do a good job. So again, from a social engineering perspective, bottom up, as a solution domain, rugged software, the rugged concept is fantastic. Triple dub, ruggedsoftware.org, Josh Corman heads that up. Really interesting stuff about how to build software packages so that if you do have a loss of availability, integrity, whatnot, the business process continues. And we look at that in my team because we're in a DevOps model. We look at that not just being the software but also the systems, right? If the system gets kicked over, can the business keep functioning? So rugged software is really good for the people who are doing the technical controls. Building in a way that maybe they don't necessarily think of as security, but definitely lends itself to being such that the boulder's higher in the hill and harder to kick down. On the top level, it's all about ensuring the executives have, uh, have sponsored us to have security and scope, right? If you think the old project management triangle, what is quality, what quality is in scope and time and budget, 
If security is in scope, that means what? That means we have the time and budget for training. If security is in scope, time and budget for internal security review. Security in scope, time and budget to bring someone out, to beat the hell out of it, to figure out what uh, the weaknesses and strengths are, the external security review. So we get that so the people who are doing the job can have the title of technical controls, so the people who are making the designs have sponsored us to ensure that things are done in a secure fashion. And they are clapping. Anyone have a time on? How are we doing on time? 241? Cool. I got time. So then, yeah, well then we do the security development life cycle, and I'm just going to whiz right through that because I'll be back to it. But basically, each step in the waterfall process has a security component, and we're ensuring that security is being looked at in each step along the way. And then when the boulder rolls off the hill, we're integrating immediately into business continuity by impact analysis immediately into your risk management by managing the vulnerabilities and configuration. So with security development life cycle, that means that you know, our systems are starting to secure, they're staying secure, which is much better. When they're on the hill, they're harder to kick down, which is much better. And it means, of course, that the boulders have the control landing. Why? Because now we have been part of the process from that boulder was a little of a pebble. I know I'm really stretching this metaphor. Work with me here, guys. <laughs> but we're really starting from the business case on up to ensure that security is a consideration. And again, maybe not the bits and bytes, but in the eyes of the organization to understand, okay, we want to grow our funds, our assets, and our management, and that translates to you doing your stuff. Here, have what you need. And that's really the mindset shift I went through the, for the past few years. Um, and I've got a better team for it. I've, got a, I've gotten out of the superhero mindset. Um, instead of trying to do everything, my team is really just fantastic about security vulnerabilities and bringing stuff to me. Um, one of the guys, one of my engineers came to me and he's like, yeah, weren't you telling me that SSH somehow protects the passwords? I'm like, yeah, absolutely, because we got Radius and it encrypts them. Oh, yeah, okay. I, I understood you were telling me about that. That's cool. He goes, do you know at the same time they put that on, they enabled HTTP? But I wouldn't have caught that as a security man. How, how often are you checking your switches? You know what I mean? I wouldn't have caught that. But he did because he's there. He's got the intimate knowledge. And it happens to me time and time again. I had this great conversation with one of my analysts who's like, arguing with a, uh, another customer because they said, okay, we're going to implement the secure API to get you your data and it's over HTTPS. I'm like, boom, check mark, encrypted. I'm good. Yes. But he knew better. He's like, whoa, 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 whoa. That sounds great. I'm glad your API is secure. He goes, but you realize you are sending us that file in HTTP or in FTP with clear text password, right? <laughs> good catch. So I'm like, all right, now we're good, okay? SSL, you know, and SFTP. Fantastic. He goes, yeah, yeah, that's good. He goes, but the data is unencrypted, and they can read it, and we can read it, so we really need a PGP first. I'm like, you're absolutely right. And the other vendor was pushing back hard. He's like, no, no, we got HTTPS. Yeah, but so what? Uh, but if you engage your people, your team, so that security is, in their mind, what they do, you know, we build rugged systems, we're rugged, we're tough, then these are natural ways that they think about things that make our job so much easier. So it's been a, been a fun few years. I'm right in the middle of a, of a very large project for my organization. Um, I'll give you my case in point. Uh, before I do, I should say, you know, there really is no best practice. I kind of troll in the beginning, right? Best practice, yeah. But obviously, we all have to do what's best for us in our organization, our team. So I always think there's like the Coke or Pepsi. I, I, we love to argue on the internet, right? My way is better in your way. My OS is better in your OS. My stand's better in your stand. And uh, whoever I was talking to yesterday at breakfast, my stand really is better in your stand. It is. But no, people love to argue, and so much so that I even mentioned one time on tour, I'm like, you know, these are Coke or Pepsi arguments. And one guy's like, boom, no, RC Cola. Okay, I'll update the slide. So <laughs> this is my case in point. Um, my case in point is a website, a website that has this fantastic line on it, site optimized for IE5 with 800 by 600 resolution. I love that. And I hope you guys all appreciate my accuracy. I actually loaded up a VM with IE5. It took me a while. So that is IE5 with site optimized. And I love that statement, right? Because it's nostalgic. It makes me yearn for the younger days, right? Where you could tell customers what resolution and browser. There was no Chrome. Google was a search engine. Men were men. Women were women. And uh, yeah, so it really makes me nostalgic when you really could just have one system and know it intimately and still be home in time for the $6 million man. I love it. But of course, all the good things must come to an end. That site really needs to be rebuilt. We have the technology. I got a private cloud? Yay. Buzzword. Um, so we can make it bigger, better, stronger, faster. Of course, we don't want to spend too much money. I think if they redid the $6 million man in today's economy, they'd be like, Steve Austin, you get a bionic leg, a walker, and an eye patch. <laughs> so, 
Yeah, don't spend too much money. Don't, I don't want to give anyone the impression I'm spending $6 million on this project, so not. Um, but yeah, we're following the classic waterfall model, but in each stage we've got security integrated. And here's what that looks like. When we started out, we started talking with the business from day one about security. And again, not talking to the trucking company about the bits and bytes, how many malware. We wasn't talking to the company about, hey, I'm really concerned about SQL injection. Have you seen this demo about, you know, the OWASP Type 10? Oh, no, we're talking about assets under management. What do we got to do to prevent our customers from losing confidence in us? So we got good buy-in on that. The other thing we talked about is, okay, you're spending a whole lot of money. Again, not six months, don't get me wrong. You're spending a whole lot of money with this vendor who's building this code. Don't you want to ensure that they deliver high-quality code? For a very small fraction, we can have someone audit that code and make sure that they are doing a good job. Got endorsement on that. From the RFP process to the statement of work to the project plan, we ensured security was a part of it. And security is a part of it in that we know their SDLC program. We know that we're, they're implementing OWASP type 10 controls, and we told them that we are checking them. And if they don't, if they fail at our test, it's on them to fix it. It's not the security guy who's getting in the way of the business who's got to get something done by Monday. No, it's part of our UAT process. Do not pass go. We will not pay you $200 until you fix your stuff. Fantastic. And we got a company in again to, to check them. And then we did an impact analysis. Impact analysis on websites is a lot of fun, right? Because confidentiality, mm, not so much. It's a public website. Availability, in our organization, it's not one of our tier ones. It is on our uh, DR program. It's a lower tier because it can be down for a day without impacting. I mean, Amazon was down for a couple days. We can be down a day. But in terms of integrity, what kind of message is this? And yeah, we're managing billions, but uh, never mind that message about Julian Sage on our website. They kicked Sony first. doesn't fly. So integrity, paramount. Boulder had to be at the top of the hill for integrity. So that was our starting point. Availability, mm, middle of the hill confidentiality, somewhere in between. In terms of the design phase, uh, again, thinking about Rugged, had a great conversation and uh, darkened conference room, high noon, it was a long meeting. Uh, their developer, our developer, staring eyeball to eyeball, 8 by 11 paper blowing in the background like tumbleweed. And I swear I heard a tumbleweed, or uh, you know, a tin whistle. I'm telling you guys I did. When my developer said, what do you mean you're not gonna validate our input? <laughs> their developers, well, you're sending us good data. Well, okay, we're sending you good data, but you still gotta validate it. Well, it's your job. Listen, one time next year, I can guarantee you one time we will send you bad data. When it's good data, tens of workflows completed by people during their normal process. When it's bad data, hundreds of workflows that will impede the business from the normal process. Good data, no in in input from our team. Bad data, our team trying to figure out what's good and what's bad, working backwards and being pulled off projects being pulled off who knows what. You absolutely, positively must Im do input validation to ensure that we do not have one very long, very bad day next year. It's one control, it took them an hour to do. It'll save us one bad day next year, but those bad days add up. And fewer bad days means more time delivering value to the business and less of a black eye. That's rugged. Again, that's my team just being awesome, that's not me. But I think that's part of the security mindset getting out of, we gotta be the superhero and getting into how can we train, empower, and endorse the people who know the systems intimately to do a good job. In the operations phase, we're using Windows. Just my duck, make sure I'm not gonna throw something at me. Uh, no, we did protocol analysis. We're a Microsoft shop, I admit it. We're doing hardened OS. Um, segment of the networks between production, QA, and dev, segment of those networks between front end, military, back tier, IPS and all the uplinks, all the good stuff. Very robust, strong security domain. And then we code, right? Again, we're a Microsoft shop, so we're looking at following the Microsoft um, security development lifecycle. So that as code's being checked in, it's being audited. We got audit points at 50%, 75 and 100%. Again, those audit points are part of UAT. What does that mean? That means they do not get paid. They do not pass go until it's secure. And any security vulnerabilities they find is on their dime to fix. Vital, because that's not us getting in the way. That's the people you guys paid, you guys being the business, a lot of money not doing a good job. And we're making sure that they are delivering what you paid for. And then the operations side, we're uh, pushing out automated configs and pen testing the heck out of it. As a pro tip, I think it's very important to have your pen tester be someone who's got in the trenches knowledge, 
you know, someone who's a little scary, someone who makes your team sit a little straight, check the firewall rules, check the file axles when they come in. With that in mind, we've hired Derek Thomas, everyone. He, he is literally in a trench in this picture in Tough Mudder. Uh, real quick funny story, because I know I've already got the sound running on time. I was working on my slides, and one of my guys comes in and goes, Wolfgang, I'd like to talk to you about the data allocation on our tier two. <laughs> oh, what? Who the hell is that? So it's Derek Thomas. He's going to check your shit. I'll be right back. That's right, you will. Uh, TBD, this project is going live at the end of the year, so we'll be integrating it with the rest of our systems. Uh, I'm using Microsoft's IT GRC pack. I like it. I've used a lot of different GRC packs. There's a lot of them out there. Value it works best for you. I like simple. I like inexpensive. That works for me. And that's just one of the projects that we're working on that kind of highlights some of the things I feel that me and my team have learned over the past few years. Uh, again, looks at secure development lifecycle. I mean, those boulders have a control landing. From day one, we have been a part of building that business case and working with the business so that when the boulder gets to the cliff, we are right there pushing it off the cliff with them. We know exactly where it's going to land, but we are absolutely ready to play that great game of, you know, capture the hill because it's going to be right where we want it. Then we can do risk management, right, which means rolling fuel or boulders farther. We know integrity is important. We know that's what really matters to the system. We know we can spend different amounts of time on availability and uh, confidentiality and prioritize as appropriate as this boulder delivers through a business process to the organization's mission. So we can roll fewer boulders farther. And that's, in my mind, a great way to get out of the stressful, it's not if but when, they're going to get us, we're going to have a resume generating event. It's a better way, it's a, a more exciting way, it's much more enjoyable working with, uh, with the team and it allows me to come down to Cleveland, which is fantastic. It's fun for me. So some quick takeaways, and I'll wrap up. You know, boulder rolling will wear you down. Boulder catching will flatten. We hear about it all the time, people being stressed, people being worn out. I tell this to people all the time because I, I talk to a lot of people in the Michigan community. They're like, it just seems like there's too much. I'm like, there is. You can't know it all. But I want to. I know. So do I. We can't. It sucks. Uh, the key thing really is protecting the organization and its ability to achieve its mission. The way to do that is knowing what the boulders mean to that organization mission. The way to do that is business continuity risk management. And of course, using social engineering skills, working on the people, knowing the people, having that business acumen so that we can explain things to when our business hears it, they go, that makes sense. Yeah, okay, you know what I'm saying. So we don't have to send them a PDF and give them to sign a PO. Uh, Key takeaway is business continuity risk management to new peanut butter and jelly. I think they work very well together. If you've got a business continuity program in your firm and you're managing security, fantastic. Make good friends with that person. they got great information for you. If you don't, fantastic. Use that as social engineering, right? Good place to start. With business continuity risk management or peanut butter and jelly, then SDL is the bread. Bake security into every single project. This day and age, we should be well beyond laptops that can't talk to projectors and <laughs> doing projects without integrating the security, you know. I, I think as an industry we're smarter than that. That's really all I have. Thank you so much. I hope you guys are having a great uh, time here at B-Sides Cleveland, and I'll see you around.